Hello and welcome to this panel discussion from Queen's University Belfast on the impact of the pandemic on our, um, on our society. My name is Professor Emma Flynn and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Enterprise here at Queen's. In this programme we'll be looking at the effects of Covid on the arts sector. How has a pandemic affected pre performing artists? How have the film and TV industries responded to the Covid crisis? And is it possible within this sector to be able to plot recovery in the face of uh, social distancing? I'm going to be joined by a panel of academic and practitioner experts. Dr Kurt Tariff is the head of the School of Arts, English and Languages here at Queen's. His expertise is drama. Kurt is particularly interested in monodrama, which was where plays attempt to communicate the world as su subjectively experienced by the protagonist with such intensity that the spe spectator feels as though they, they have merged with the protagonist. In his work, Kurtz has traced this trend back to the 18th century m music and then uses this trait as a form of means to analyse drama to the present day. Dr Ali Fitzgibbon is also from the School of Arts, English and Languages here at Queen's. She has combined her interest in arts management with an independent producing programme and consultancy in the cultural sector since 2015. She has over 25 years of experience in the international arts and cultural sector and has a substantial portfolio of experience working as a programmer and producer at community, national and international level in theatres, festivals and outdoor youth arts. Stephen Beggs is a freelance actor, director and facilitator. He's also a writer and producer. He's currently chair of the Equity Northern Ireland National Committee the union representing more than 47,000 performers and creative practitioners. Equity brings together entertainment professionals, ensures that their demands are heard, whether these are for decent pay, better health and safety regulations, or more opportunities for all, regardless of their gender, ethnicity, sexuality, disability or class. Margaret Henry is CEO of Thrive. Thrive is an organisation that supports arts, culture and heritage organisations to understand and grow their audiences. Margaret is also a member of the Arts Collaboration Network. Only last week, she represented the network at the meeting of the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee of Communities to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the arts sector. Margaret has extensive strategic marketing and leadership experience and was pre previously head of marketing for BBC Sport and Radio 5 Live. Well, so thank you very much, everybody, for giving up your time today. It's going to be a really informative discussion about the effect of COVID on the performing arts. And I know it's really, really important that we think about this and think about a way forward. So um, I think the first thing I'd like to ask is like to ask Stephen that we're going to be hearing about the academic perspective. But you as an actor, you must have some real personal experiences about the effect of COVID. So can you explain a little bit about how the pandemic has affected you and also perhaps other actors that you know, may know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was, I suppose, along with a lot of other um self-employed people around uh, the world. Um, I went from having a very full diary of performances and workshops and rehearsals uh, and over the course of um, a week or even a couple of days everything dropped out of that diary. It went from full to completely empty um, and there was this sudden panic about uh, you know, projects that I'd been working on to set up for a long time and that involved lots of different people and um, uh, all suddenly dropping away. Uh, and just that sense of um, not having any idea how long it would last. You know, if um, I was talking to someone the other day that said that if we'd been told back in March that, uh, you know, we could sort of count on things happening at the end of August, you would have thought, gosh, that's a, a while, but at least we would have known what we were heading towards. But to a certain extent, we still don't know what we're heading towards. Um, there are certain things that may or may not be able to happen. Um, my, my first, uh, what happened to begin with really was that um, uh, as as the, my position with equity as the, the Northern Ireland chair of equity, uh, we were rallying round to try and see just how everyone was doing, really, you know, and to um, uh, to 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 reach out to as many uh, our members and uh, and individual um, uh, individual artists of all kinds to 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 find out what position they had been left in, really. Um, 
uh, and and to see then how we could how we could best support them. Um, the Equity Benevolent Fund was absolutely stretched to its limits. Uh, every available penny uh, that was in equity that was being held for other things all got put into the Benevolent Fund. There's been huge fundraising uh by equity to uh, uh to top that fund up because of the fact that it's been squeezed to its to its limits um i know that there have been lots of um uh, independent schemes the bread and butter scheme and things like that that was set up to um again to help uh, uh, individuals working in the industry in need from my perspective i luckily was able to uh, avail of the government's um, individual emergency support scheme um, as, a, as a freelancer of, of many years standing. But um, I know that there are an awful lot of uh, young uh, uh, professionals who maybe had only started their careers, maybe this is their first year of self-employment, or um, people that have been on maternity leave that had eaten into their, um, uh, their you know, their accumulated time that was 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 available for that um um qualification um th quite a few people fell through the cracks there you know so that was um um uh, uh that was of great concern some of my work went very suddenly online i was due to do a performance as part of the imagine festival uh and and i ended up doing that from my living room um which was uh, a great experience, a bit of a baptism of fire because I'd, you know, had to get to grips with how to set the room up in terms of, uh, you know, making it a half decent recording and and also to um, get my, um, drag my wife and daughter into um, filming me for lots of different things. <laughs> I, one big thing that dropped away almost completely was workshops for me because obviously by definition, that's gathering large groups of people together and, and working with them generally on their own premises. But um, within a certain amount of time, I had um, I had managed to deliver a successful Zoom drama workshop, which is a very odd uh, experience, but seemed to work very well. Um, I, I've learned a lot about the the idea of working with someone who is looking after the technical side of things while I deliver the the content. You know, so I'm not having to help people to uh you know to w unmute themselves <laughs> all that stuff uh so uh, uh that yeah so that's where well that was a kind of a confidence boost that getting one of those done uh you know meant that i was able to to do more but i am now interestingly as we get to this this stage of of, of lockdown and easing um i am due to perform a show that i've been working on for a couple of years in the east side arts festival and it is supposed to still go be going ahead with an actual live audience um, as part of the festival. Um, the the venue is a, a a shop unit in Conswater Shopping Centre, an old unit which is all set up for social distancing and all the rest of it. Um, and it's a one man show, so it can be rehearsed and performed within all of the guidelines. Um, so all being well and things remaining as they are or getting better between now and the end of August. Um, that's on the horizon, which is very encouraging. But I worry, I worry greatly about um, uh, the ability of us to be able to to do anything other than one man shows or uh, Zoom workshops or um, uh, socially distanced events in car parks for for a great deal of time to come. You know, um, I can't, I can't, I can't imagine myself being back on stage in a in a in a standard theatre context for quite a while uh, for lots of different reasons, which I'm sure we're going to talk about today. Um, I, I also know that there's been a lot of uh, worry about the fact that venues might be able to open, but might just not be able to put on actual performances because of social distancing, the performers and 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 the audience um, and the difficulties with singing in terms of, you know, um, communicating, um, potentially uh, communicating uh, vir the virus. So it's, uh, um, the backstage areas in most of the places that I would perform would be extremely difficult places to socially distance in, you know, let alone the actual stage uh, um, and front of house areas and all that. So, um, so yeah, there we go. That's that's a bit of a, uh, a broad no, it's, up. <laughs> it's very interesting, and and it's come through with a lot of the same sorts of themes that we've heard in other podcasts within this particular series, which is about our ability to be able to innovate. Yeah. And really difficult circumstances. We've learned how to do things very quickly 
in different ways and to adapt. But there are still some challenges that are really, really difficult for us to try to overcome. So I suppose, Kurt, this is a question that um, I think Stephen's uh, reflections on his own personal experience sits very well in, in terms of what I'd like to ask you, which is about your interests within the theatre. I mean, we've touched a little bit already on some of the challenges that you've got, but um, can you think about other areas uh, within the theatre, uh, you know, other issues that we've had to overcome and also whether or not there are other sectors within the performing arts that maybe um, don't face such challenging circumstances like the theatre is facing? Well, I mean, a lot of these problems, as as Stephen suggested, are really kind of across the arts. And they, I mean, Stephen raised the, the problem of singing and there's probably no one in a worse situation than something like an opera company or a choir or something like that, where it's just real. I mean, forget about audiences. It's hard to imagine how you get a choir together anytime in the near future, considering that it seems to be one of the easiest ways of transmitting the virus. I, I think there's something really, I don't I, I don't even want to say interesting, because I think there's a, a, a tendency to look at this as, oh, isn't this fascinating? And it's not fascinating because it's people's lives involved. Uh, and but but I do think, you know, you listen to BBC four in the morning and there, you know, there's a lot of talk about the death of theater, the death of the arts. And I think there is, a, a, you know, partly a situation where very, very importantly, you have the leaders of arts organizations coming out to say, you know, this is no joke. You, we, we need funding. We need help now. And they're absolutely right to do so. But. It will still be here. It's not going anywhere. The death of theater has been declared many, many times before. It will come back, but just figuring that it's going to come back just as strong in the same ways. And maybe we don't want it in the same ways, but that's not the question. It's how we make sure that the artists who provide us with the work are able to continue to make a living doing it. Um, there, you know, part of this is is in the background of a general sense that artists just do it for the love of the thing, uh, as though that is even remotely a possibility. So, you know, just in basic terms of the way in which the government funds the arts in general, but also in which the way in, we as audiences, we as participants in the arts process, I mean, you know, we bring in artists to work with our students all the time. We certainly try to work with arts organizations on various levels in terms of interchange between Queens and these organizations. And sure, a lot of the time it's a it's an in-kind exchange. But more and more, you know, we, we need to remain aware that every time something happens for free, there's probably a lot of people not getting paid. So it's been really fascinating for me to watch all the wonderful and incredible things that our former students have been doing, that the artists that, that I know in Belfast have been doing during the pandemic to keep the arts alive. And really, I think, uh, I, I was curious, I'll, I'm gonna uh, ask Stephen later to, to qualify whether when he said a, a Zoom workshop, if he was talking about a workshop on Zoom or a workshop about making art on Zoom. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, new kinds of art are coming out of this and that's interesting and fascinating. But I, I hope, and I know that, that Ali will speak to this as well, that new models of funding are part of this process as well, because part of this has to be a rethink of the way we value art and a rethink of our relationship to it. That's that's absolutely fascinating. It's about, I think, you know, will it change the whole landscape completely? And I think this is a question I'd like to come back to as a whole group. Uh, before we kind of have some initial reflections about where we are, because I think only when we've had a look at exactly the landscape and, and can sort of map out what the problems are and what the opportunities are, can we then go forward and project what we think is going to happen. So um, I'd like to turn to Ali now and say you're interested in the kind of inclusion and diversity uh, of the performing arts. And do you think that there are certain groups that have been particularly impacted by the pandemic? Yeah, um, I mean, to echo kind of everything that kind of Stephen and Kurt have been saying, there have been, I suppose, the, the position I would come from is a lot of the problems with the equality, inequality and diversity in the performing arts predate the pandemic. And what we've seen is quite a lot of things come up to the surface, you know, 
artists as freelancer as a freelance workforce were already in a highly precarious position, which is why when the government was very, very slow to introduce self-employed support and introduce something that actors and a lot of performers fell through, that we actually ended up with a situation where they were much more hard hit in the same way that a lot of the precarious gig economy workers of our society are. I think the thing that has come laterally is a realisation that this is a fairly major issue involving thousands of people. Where we're seeing um, a really interesting response is that the first response of putting work online with a lot of theatres went to their archives, they created short commission Zoom performances, and suddenly somebody sitting in rural Fermanagh or in Cornwall or in, you know, the Highlands of Scotland could see Things like the Royal Shakespeare Company, the National Theatre, opera performances, they could see, you know, museums and galleries putting their work online was an amazing in terms of changing the access. And a lot of people say, for example, people with disabilities, older people were suddenly able to access, you know, free and without leaving their homes, they could access these amazing experiences that some would say they should always have been able to access. On the flip side... You then had people who are practitioners suddenly finding themselves locked in their homes, unable to access their careers. So one of the people I've been watching is somebody like Jess Tom from Tourette's Hero, who is who identifies herself as a disabled artist and practitioner and theatre maker. And she's already put out a kind of a cry saying, please remember that those of us who are people with disabilities and those of us who have underlying health conditions as members of this industry will be left behind when the world begins to reopen. Now, we're not seeing that happen in a great rush, but some of the things like the ability to have Zoom calls, the ability to live in a rural area as an artist and as a person with, working within the sector were great advantages that maybe we've become more used to. But if we are somebody who actually will have to live that life for longer, we have to think quite carefully how we stay inclusive as an industry and not roll back. So some of the change that we're looking at could be really, really positive. Um, it's whether we can, whether the sector can survive long enough to take advantage of those changes and rethinking how we do business. Yeah, I think, again, one of the themes that's come up in the series is the fact that a lot of the difficulties that we've seen haven't actually been caused by the pandemic. They've, they've been exacerbated by the pandemic. They, these things aren't new. These were problems that should have been solved before, but now we've really facing them head on and we've got to think about creative solutions about how to get through it and I think um, again the whole kind of leveling up and not leaving anybody behind agenda has also been something that has come through as well how can we make sure that we take everybody with us and that we see we see success and 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 getting through this for for all and not for just certain subgroups who happen potentially to be more privileged than others. So, Margaret, you have a kind of remit where you've been looking um, across the whole of Northern Ireland in terms of the performing arts. And I'd be interested to hear about your reflections from a kind of geographical perspective and a regional perspective about whether or not there are certain areas that have seen uh, more problems. And also maybe some of the discussions that you've been having in terms of that more holistic approach that you that you and that vision that you've got. Mm. Uh, thank you. Well, I mean, I would echo what, what, what's been said so far in terms of both the impact and also the opportunities. And, you know, there are always opportunities, even out of the most darkest and, and challenging of situations. And this, I think, is the same. From our point of view and from the work I've been doing, the work we've been doing in Thrive, I suppose, is twofold. We are a sector support organisation, so therefore we've been talking to lots and lots of organisations in the sector, uh, many of whom I think just had a period of shock initially and a period of just let's everybody get home and try to get set up at home. And that was that was frantic and felt incredibly um, stressful initially. Um, since then, organisations are trying to think about plans, be that immediate plans around reopening and what does that mean? And yet the moving of the goalposts, because the Northern Ireland executive, for example, is making twice weekly announcements now. And we understand that. But every time an announcement is made, you rip your plans up and you start again. So that that is the fast moving pace of all of this has been extremely challenging for the organisations that we're working with. And I think what is interesting, a lot of the the organisations we work with cover a different, uh, there are lots of different types in terms of where they sit. 
So for some, they are standalone arts organisations, possibly funded in part by the Arts Council of Northern Ireland, for example, but often also now um, because of cuts in public funding over the last number of years, have been making up a lot of their income through earned income. So whether that is the box office income, which is most obvious, but also ancillary income. So literally millions of pounds, whether that is the food and the drink that they sell in their bars, they didn't open to sell food, but that money supports what you see on a stage or you see in a gallery, um, you know, sponsorship, private hires, lots of the arts buildings throughout Northern Ireland, whether you're talking about the Burnavon and Cookstown or whether you're talking about the Alley in Straban, they would hire out their spaces for conferences, for private events, for launches, again, all gone. So there is a real challenge there um, around all of that, that income. And I think we used to feel, I think those who were maybe primarily funded by the Arts Council and then earner, earning our own income, I think we used to think that those venues and organisations that were wholly under the umbrella of a council were maybe a bit more fortunate. But they're now facing massive losses themselves. And I was on a conversation with a couple of people from the local authorities all budgets frozen, you know, all budgets centralised, um, a need to, you know, then have an emergency budget coming up. Now, where is arts and culture going to sit in that? We know that arts and culture has a massive role to play in the social and economic future of, of all of these areas across Northern Ireland, but where's it going to play? The other challenge, and Ali sort of referred to it as well, is the online offering. And again, I think we won't go back. I think online and digital is going to remain part of our offer. Uh, none of our audiences are telling us that it replaces live. Quite the reverse. They still miss live. You know, we have 88% of audiences telling us it's, you know, we want to get back to live at some point. And also in terms of digital, there are a lot of people for whom digital access is a problem in Northern Ireland. We've had this rural broadband issue now for a very, very long time. And I know the Rural uh, rural Communities Network have been flagging that a lot in COVID. So we are in danger of, you know, if the, the digital is prolonged of, of, of um, audiences not being able to, to access. And again, you know, with audiences with a disability, absolutely some um, things are now more available, but not everything. For us, we're seeing audience confidence is low, not in terms of wanting to come back, but in terms of public health, just their safety. You know, they want to come out to things, but they absolutely must have those measures in place and they must be confident that they can be safe. And of course, that's absolutely right. Um, and so, you know, that is big challenges, even for galleries who, you know, don't have the same issues around maybe performance, but but even just bringing people into your gallery, the guidelines are you divide your staff up so that you've two teams so that one doesn't get in fact the other, et cetera, et cetera. Some of our best staffed galleries have four members of staff to begin with. So dividing those up into a team, a team of two is not really going to work. So there's all of those issues. And then I think what we've tried to do, the Arts Collaboration Network, of which I, I am a convener, to be honest, we've been meeting for about three years and we're a group of sector support organisations. So we, a lot of us have members, a lot of us work across different areas, and we came together to try to just collaborate a bit more. But really COVID-19 forced our hand and we began to meet at the start of this um, situation. We realised that this was going to be huge and unlike anything any of us had ever seen. So we then felt the need to try to open up conversations. So we've talked a lot to um, freelancers and creatives um, to hear, as Stephen has, has very well um, shown, their stories and their issues. There's been a venues group set up as well to try and bring together because, again, the venues have some particular issues. So we're talking a lot with our network of networks, I suppose. And then out of that, the Arts Collaboration Network developed um, a paper, which was a recovery paper, which had five asks in it and an, an amount of money. And that was really to just get us over the initial survival, the emergency, and to start to do some adaptation. 
And I think where we are now, and I've just come off a conversation this afternoon where there is a need for a much bigger ask and a much bigger vision for the future. As both Ali, Stephen and, and Kurt have said, things were not working beforehand. Um, be that in the funding structures, be that in the distribution of funding, be that in um, access, diversity, inclusion, all of those things. And we do have an opportunity to fix it. We in the Arts Collaboration Network are very much advocating that as a co-design and collaborative process. We all need to work together. This is not just the responsibility of one part of the sector, of a statutory body or of a department. It's the responsibility of all of us. And to, I suppose, not let the kind of rush back to let's get the economy spending again, which I know is important because that's about jobs and that's important, but not let that rush completely overwhelm our opportunities here to build back a better, more fair, more equitable society and indeed a better, more fair, equitable art sector. And so that's that's the tension. And I think that's what people are finding um, that they're trying to, to manage as we go forward. Okay, so that, that you've offered us an awful lot to think about within that. And I suppose I'd like to open up the whole discussion to, to everybody to say, you know, this co-production, what do people want to see now moving forward? What changes do we want to adopt or what opportunities can we see? And and I suppose one of the things that I've noticed personally and, and from also um, just, just in the broader context, I think people appreciate the arts more now. I think we took them for granted. And I think in the same way that we have taken for granted getting on an aeroplane or just walking to work or just going to the shops, the the lack of ability to be able to go out and appreciate the arts has been quite pertinent for some people and some people have had to take that into their homes and have have been experiencing the arts on a very personal level within their home environments but it's not the same as experiencing professional performance or community performances of groups so I suppose I'm going to, I'm just, it's a personal reflection, I suppose, is that this is one opportunity that there is a, a desire and a motivation from people to be able to see the, the, the arts thriving and succeeding. But, but what would people like to see? What would thriving and succeeding in, in I hate the phrase, but the new normal look like? I think there's, um, there's an interesting thing that has come up and it's come up in a number of different places in a number of different ways. And one is, I think there's been a tendency to think of the public debate around the arts as this thing that's over here that is arts policy and funding bodies and arts councils and theatres and opera houses and dance companies and, you know, kind of institutions. And I think what's happened is a, a big awareness has grown, as you say, about what people think of as the arts but also the problems that have arisen have exposed the fact that this is a much broader policy issue. So, for example, things like wage reform, social welfare policy, understanding how arts and culture fits into community planning, um, things around licensing, around public health, have all become completely merged and intrinsic to when, what we think about when we think about the future of the arts. So actually starting to see arts and cultural debates in those policy areas, I think would be not only necessary, but a really valuable step forward that starts to kind of reintegrate that debate. And I think it's very particular to Northern Ireland. There's a tendency to push things into silos, possibly because of the way our governance works, is we tend to go into little boxes and this is what this is about. But seeing the arts as part of, as equally part of the voluntary sector, as part of the creative industries, as part of our kind of public, our public engagement as a community is quite interesting. I think that's a real potential area that I'd like to see movement on. Yeah, I mean, we're, I, we're, we're a sector that should be at the at the center of rebuilding a society after after a crisis like this. You know, where the uh, the uh, the arts should be right at the heart of that. You know, helping every area of of, of society to recover. I do think, you know, in terms of what uh, people were saying about that idea of um, it, Margaret, I think, was saying about how it's our, our, all of our responsibilities to work together. One thing that that really impressed me throughout the, the, the crisis was how how our industry did come together here locally um, in terms of the way the arts organizations, the producing theater companies and the venues supported 
um, the individual workers, whether it be uh, companies doing everything they could to honour payments for cancelled jobs, um, uh, finding what I'm the chair of Tinderbox Theatre Company and and um, our artistic director and producers first act was to look at ways of uh, being able to support um, uh, freelancers that that were left with with no work, um, uh, very small amounts of money, levering um, great creativity and, and amazing when you are uh, you, you know what a small amount of money will do to help people. Um, again, I think I think quite a lot of the time people don't realize uh, people outside of the industry don't realize what what small amounts of money we make uh, amazing things with. Um, and uh, and I think it was just I felt very very supported as an individual artist and and performer. Um, I felt very much that our whole big family here swung into action, which was, um, uh, and I think that stands us in very good stead for for moving forward. You know, yeah, I I, I agree. I think I think a couple of things have happened. I think at last there's been a recognition that people mightn't say I do arts and culture, but people do it every single day. There is everyday arts and culture happening in this country and we've done some research within my organisation Thrive and we've seen, we did some research recently in Derry City and Strabane District Council area and we spoke face to face to um, the residents there and we discovered that 95%, no, 95% of people living in that area had attended or visited a cultural place over a 12 month period. Further to that, 92% of people living in that area had taken part in a cultural activity. Now, it may have been singing in a community choir. It may have been joining a book club. So they may not have called it the arts, as you know we often hear it referred to, but that is exactly what they were doing. And as Stephen says, they were doing it for a whole host of different reasons, whether it was mental health, whether it was just for a bit of fun, whether it was to reduce their social isolation, whatever it was. And so I think that those kinds of figures that we've been able to present and also then that increase that we did see in terms of people consuming things online while we were all locked down, whether it was to help with homeschooling or whether it was to just get a break from the, the hard news we were dealing with. We saw those increases happen in all those different areas of arts and culture. And I think all of that has really started to help the penny to drop. And I will say this, and I hope we're not listening to this recording in a year's time or two years time, and I have to eat my words. But from the meetings that the Arts Collaboration Network has been involved in, two things have happened. Number one, the cross-cutting argument will never need to be made again. They get it. Our politicians get it. They are, you know, when we met with the Department for Communities Committee, they were, yes, writing to the Minister for Communities, but they wanted to write to every other minister on the executive because they get it and they get that. And they also get the fact that we are a profession. Now, yes, many people do arts and cultures hobbies. Of course they do, but we don't. For us, it is our profession. And I think that recognition has also has also happened. So in many ways, for me, that is two positives that have come out of what is an incredibly difficult situation and that we have an opportunity to build on that now. So I think that's been some of the things. And I think having people, citizens, audiences, visitors, participants, whatever you want to call them, having them at the heart of this rebuild as we go forward is absolutely the way to make a change and make a difference. And I think if we continue to do that along with all the professional talent that we have right across the sector, then we can build it back stronger. And that would be my kind of real hope that all of us now who, who have a stake in the sector, audiences included, we all are in those conversations together. And that to me could be transformational and, and well worth well worth pushing for. I'd kind of like to 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 shift things a little bit because I, I'm I've I've already mentioned that I'm an optimist in all of this, or at least as much of an optimist as I can be, in that theater will come back, and we've all kind of been saying we'll be back. Everything's everything's going to be okay, not without a lot of work. But 
I, I think maybe the, the thing that I read recently that disturbed me the most was an article, I think, in The Guardian that was talking about concerns that especially our largest venues, for us, a, a venue like The Lyric, will almost by necessity be programming safe choices. Uh, popular works that will bring in the largest possible audiences. Now, I have the greatest confidence uh, in in companies like Tinderbox. I know they'll be doing you know work that speaks to the issues that we we face as a, a society all the time. And I know that Jimmy Fay will be working to ensure that the lyric continues to produce important work. But the, it's the funding model. It goes back to the funding model. We need to make sure that our, you know, our, our signature company, a company like the Lyric Theater, that their sole concern is not simply filling 90% of their seats, otherwise they can't stay afloat. So we need to think about the arts not solely as entertainment. Of course it's entertainment. But I, I'm, I am hopeful that one of the things that we miss the most about a, an art like theater that can speak to the local more perhaps than some of the other arts, than, than film, for example, that we've realized that this is where we get that kind of sustenance, that this is where we realize where our stories are told and where we go to see ourselves is in our theaters in Northern Ireland or any other locality. Uh, and that we, we do make the effort to ensure we continue to tell those stories. And I wonder if in that, if we can borrow some of the attitude, maybe, that we've seen in some of our other creative industries. So I suppose I'm talking about the whole digital and tech sector in Northern Ireland, which is very successful, but they're allowed to fail fast. They're all about trying new things. Failure's fine. You learn, you move on. Risk, risk is good as long as it's managed, as long as it's, you know, whereas we've shied away from that and we've been so risk averse, you know, again, partly because of the funding model and the pressures there and the fact that we've been asked to account for outputs rather than actual outcomes. And so I think if we could borrow some of that agile nature, that that creative risk taking, that gosh is in the DNA of so many people that work in the sector, but it's almost been corralled out of us. Um, if we could borrow that from those other sectors in Northern Ireland, where Invest NI will recognise that you have to kind of invest to try something to then achieve something greater then maybe now is the time for that to happen as well and for us to be able to step forward and be the genuine leaders in terms of creative risk taking that we can absolutely be. I think there's an interesting thing about how kind of what risk is and how, how audiences are, see, are seen as responding to risk. So this was always a conversation and, you know, everybody here will recognise for a long time there was an assumption that, you know, to maximise your box office, you needed to go for something that was maybe a bit safer, a bit more conservative. And to a certain extent, you know, the the absolute crisis of the West End at the moment, which is probably more serious than some of what's going on in Northern Ireland, actually would bear that out. But one of the interesting things that I've seen is looking at where community uh, or arts organisations and theatre organisations that have stronger relationships with their local communities have an edge on this in that, number one, they're working at a smaller scale. They can they can pivot faster. They can change their programming faster. And when we think of the Lyric, the Lyric is not a big venue in the scale of theatre venues. It's actually quite small. So it can, if the model is right, if the relationship is right, if the community relationship is right. And there's a really interesting uh, American kind of, researcher Alan Brown who talks about you know if you want to look at where your audiences are you have to look at you you can't look at the program before you look at the audience so it's as much about that citizenship thing that, that Margaret was talking about and bringing the citizens into the theatre but the other bit that I think is a new discussion around local if we're going to see restricted travel the business model of the performing arts outside of venues is touring and particularly and as an island nation it's international touring. So we have major concerns. I was part of a, an international kitchen table, it was called, where there were 150 different companies who work specifically for young audiences, all discussing the fact that their business model is built around international festivals, international touring, none of which is going to be coming back in the next 18 months. And showing a video of a performance at an international festival is not the same thing. And what we're talking about is a need to rethink the local and bring back, so we need to put artists back into communities. And maybe one of the other ways to look at that community planning debate 
is to put artists, to make communities and local authorities in some way responsible for the artists who inhabit that community and create a relationship between artists and communities, whether it's a theatre company, an individual artist, you know, there are all different ways in which it can be done. In County Donegal years and years ago, actually paid an annual stipend to a local poet in order to inherit his estate because they had such faith in his work. You know, do we need to think about those kinds of things as models to look at how we create internal circuits where we can be more sustainable, be more resilient and actually be more environmentally sound as well? There's been some lovely work done um, in terms of what you said about that, the local um, communities Ali, in, in East Belfast, um, uh, where I would do a lot of my work. You know, it's, um, uh, the, you know, the, the interesting sort of connections between like the East Side Partnership, uh, which works you know, on, a, on a very uh, community based level and, and East Side Arts um, and, and how, you know, uh, one side of the uh organization is is working you know to uh, with with community groups of all different kinds and, and and environmental uh projects and all the rest of it so it's it uh, and then um that cross pollinates them with the uh um with east side arts and the development of arts activity in that in that part of the city um and and it's been a fantastic experience of of create creating arts and activities for audiences but also creating audiences for for arts and activities i mean i i am um, on a very i know when we're talking about trying to bring people up it, back into massive uh venues um uh, which is so tricky but also one of the one of the 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 lovely things that i experienced during lockdown was when uh east side arts brought me and a number of colleagues to do a uh, a performance uh, for the residents of, of a local uh, nursing home, big nursing home in, in, in East Belfast. And um, the residents had not been out through the door in 10 weeks, something like that, not even to to the little garden outside. And they'd had COVID in, in the home. It was it was a very, very uh, stressful and difficult time. Um, and and we did this 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 event in, in essentially in the car park, you know, quite low tech, uh, but but the the sense of an arts event having a real, a really genuine, direct, important impact on 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 uh, on an audience that were that had been so battered by this uh, by by this situation, um, it, it felt like a brilliant partnership between community organisations, umbrella organisations for a local area and and artists. Um, and that that seemed to me to be uh, that seems to be something for me that was is a very positive thing going forward. I also think that there's a number of things where if you look at the likes of and I'm conscious of not wanting to do kind of to Belfast, but going back to East Belfast and um, somebody like Framework Gallery, who are, you know, pretty much a one woman band who also run a kind of queer collective. And they wouldn't necessarily have been seen as the kind of the spirit of the East Belfast community. And yet they instantly stepped into gear and converted their gallery into a soup kitchen. And they've now distributed 10,000 meals entirely fundraised by themselves. And, and to me, these are really interesting senses of arts and arts organisations as civic entities that see themselves as contributing to the community, as citizens of that community. The Duncairn Centre is similar We've seen somebody like Dylan Quinn down in Fermanagh, who for years has been, I think, probably saving the physical health of the people of Enniskillen by doing dance classes, um, has also developed a relationship with them that is sustainable in a sense that I don't know anybody who can run a contemporary dance company in a rural area and thrive with it on some level. Um, so there's kind of really interesting senses of arts organisations kind of pivoting and changing and recognising the spirit of need that was in the community. And despite having difficulty being able to shift and adjust, and I hope we kind of keep that, that sense of being more of a facility for a community and not necessarily totally focused, particularly when we look at the buildings. I think um, I think you're you're absolutely right, and I wonder if the 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 article that Kurt was referring to is is wrong from what I'm hearing. This idea that. 
because you have to you, you're going to be driven by the economics you're going to be kind of regressing to the mean and going for the majority as opposed to whereas what you're telling me is that the arts is creative it can be risky so if you think about social distancing your audience is going to be smaller but let's get a collective of individuals who are small but want to see something specific that may be risky so rather than going for the majority maybe the solution is to actually go, no, we're going to try things that are really unusual because now is the time because we're only going to be playing for 10 to 15 people as opposed to 40 or to 50 people. And to be thinking about how you can use spaces and localities more creatively than we have done previously. So the old, the old I mean, I'm sure that you all don't do this, but the old theatre style of the stage and then the audience maybe that's now gone for a while because that's not going to work and actually more open spaces more creative spaces is what we're going to be seeing do you think this kind of is is we're going to see a difference between those that are professional performing arts and those that are voluntary performing arts and that's where we'll see a distinction of the creativity there's a great uh interaction between the various um uh, sections of, of of the arts uh, industry here uh, in Northern Ireland, anyway. Both, I mean, very. These are very broad strokes, uh, by but saying you know, kind of a community, amateur, professional, um, uh, um, educational. Uh, the, the 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 everything is so intertwined uh, in arts projects here in in Northern Ireland, and um, and I think sometimes actually a combination of those areas may that 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 interaction between those areas may may increase you know as uh, especially what we're talking about that idea of of us um embedding ourselves maybe more in our local areas you know um and and i think just recently i've been very encouraged by the the fact that people seem a lot several of the projects that i've been involved with which have had paying audiences online projects i mean people seem very happy to be paying what they would what they might pay to go to an actual venue to see it to see it um to sit in their living room and watch something on uh on their on their television screen or their computer screen um obviously that's not always the case i know don donations can be very hit and miss you know um but things that are actually ticketed um uh and not not necessarily um in my experience certainly so far we're not talking about um uh, big mainstream things but but you know real really healthy uh figures for people paying for a ticket for something um relatively you know much less mainstream that that seems to be so people do seem to be valuing it in that in the way that um that you might have worried they mightn't if it was all being if it was all available for free you know um, and I think I think value is the key word there. Uh, we often talk about price as a barrier and you know, you can't charge X for something. It's too high a price or too low a price or whatever. Mm. Um, and we certainly have to be, you know, cognizant, but at the end of the day, it is value. And, you know, to the point about the kind of community arts, voluntary arts, you know, people will enjoy what it is that is fulfilling their need at a particular time. So whether that is a, an experience within the voluntary arts, an experience within the community arts or the so-called professional arts, you know, I, th I think it's all about what people need at a particular time. So I think what we don't want to do is subdivide ourselves um, at a time when all of our skills across all of those elements of the sector are going to be really necessary if we're going to make it out of this. So I think that's that's what we need to be careful about, I think. I think I think there's also always always been this history that there's been a tendency to again go back to the silos to say this is this kind of thing and that is that kind of thing and you know I'm a big fan of saying everybody should be able to access those large scale mainstream productions and I do look forward to sitting in a big auditorium and being part of that that kind of massed uh, audience experience but what has always been the case is people have always worked in this portfolio way. They've always shifted backwards and forwards. And it's that ecology that makes some of the, the best creative work happen. But also Northern Ireland has a very particular history of that because of its scale. If you go back to the 70s and 80s and you look at, you know, Sharabank, who were like a radical women's political theatre company, they also deliberately chose to perform in communities. They went on to form some of the kind of the most interesting, most successful companies. The founder of Replay, Brenda Winter, 
was kind of largely kind of credited as being involved in kind of the foundation of theatre for young audiences in Northern Ireland. So these are really complex. It's a bit like kind of rock family trees. These are really complex family histories of practice that have moved between different forms. If you look at the relationship between theatre and carnival and circus arts in Northern Ireland, similarly, you'll see the same thing. And you possibly see it more in these islands than you would in mainstream in mainland Europe, for example. I want to I want to pick up on on kind of all of those points uh, and and your question, Emma. Uh, just to start with, the I, I think the question isn't really so much uh, amateur versus professional, and it kind of as as you've all been saying, but really kind of more small theater companies and big heavily funded ones, because in a weird kind of reversal of the way things normally work, all of a sudden having the building is a liability having to deal both with the costs of the building that aren't going away or at least aren't going fully away. And also the idea, as you said, they're pretty locked into the proscenium type model. It's really hard for them to get away from that because their building is designed that way. Whereas the smaller companies that don't have permanent spaces actually are freer to reimagine the way they think of space. And that will, I think, permit for a kind of experimentation it'll be harder to get in the larger theaters. Uh, responding to the question of value, I, I, I will say just from personal experience, and of course, I'm in a particular place here, but I've got a lot of friends in the arts. Obviously, we all do. I have never been uh, at, at any point in my life uh, uh, living as a freelancer, as many of my friends have. And it never, despite having very close friends in this situation, it never, ever hit me just what this meant until this happened you know suddenly realizing just how privileged and how secure i was to be pretty sure that i had a paycheck coming for the foreseeable future and realizing that all of a sudden many of my friends didn't i think has made me i mean certainly now there's never any question if i'm watching something online i'm donating <laughs> and i think maybe that sense that people have that like oh, you know, yes, I'm going to the theater and either A, those people are doing it for the love of it, so either it doesn't really matter how much I pay or if I pay at all, it's fine, or or even more than that, they wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't, if they weren't getting paid, if they weren't getting, you know, if they didn't have a secure income. Perhaps this will bring home to people, it, you know, it's it has always been a tough business and no one's saying you're suddenly, everyone is going to be guaranteed a very, very healthy income, but at the very least, hopefully it will make people realize that it's not free to make art and people need to feel secure no matter what they do. Um, yeah. I'd like to ask one final question to everybody. I'm gonna to turn to everybody now uh, in turn. And I mean, what do you want to see in the future? And, and to make that happen, what needs to happen? So, you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen. I do think we have seen, um, Margaret's already made some reference to, you know, effective packages that we've had from policymakers. But what do we want to see either from community groups, from performers, to, from the audiences, from the policymakers to be able to achieve the visions that we have for the future? So, Margaret, I'll turn to you first. Um, I suppose what I want to say is I genuinely want to see people in Northern Ireland being part and being at the centre of the the renewal of the sector. And by that, I suppose, I mean, uh, you know, in some ways you look at what libraries have done and how libraries have kind of reinvented themselves to become essential parts of the community. And in many places, arts organisations and arts venues are essential parts of the community. And I want to see that. I want to see people just being in those places and experiencing those work, uh, that work and valuing it and recognizing it for what it is, as, as Kurt has said, and that there is, a, I suppose, a, a feeling of equity between the artists and the creatives and the audiences and the people and that they come together and that's when the magic really happens and that's when the important stuff really happens and the best stuff really happens. And I suppose then what I want to say to those who are responsible for policy or for the structures is give us the freedom and trust us, both us and people to do that. And, and, you know, open it up and don't make it about bureaucracy and red tape and counting numbers. Give us the freedom and trust us and we will, you know, repay you with a much better Northern Ireland. 
Uh, Ali, what would you like to see? Can, can I have everything that everybody else wants? <laughs> so yeah, my, cool. my, mine is, I, I suppose what I think is kind of, it's that same idea of, um, to me, it's about citizenship. So the idea of imagining a future of um, artistic work, whether it's paid and unpaid and where it is a profession that it is paid, um, to see it as a function of citizenship, whether it's through the curriculum, whether it's through how we as um, higher education institutions train people to work in the field or to appreciate it, to critique it, whether people work in the sector or see it as part of their community, that it is an essential function of citizenship to be kind of culturally engaged, culturally informed, culturally active, culturally owning. Um, to me, that would be a really powerful thing. Brilliant. That's very, very, very thoughtful. Uh, Stephen, what about you? Um, I suppose uh, sort of from a from a freelancer perspective and, and, and an individual artist perspective, I, I, I suppose I I'd like to think that the that the kind of the diversity of of artistic output which um is going to have to be uh, not just have to be but you know it it, it it it's a great thing gonna be a great thing going forward that it is well supported um uh, again i think as as margaret was saying that there is that flexibility of saying don't don't hold your arts organizations and your individual artists to the sort of structures and and um styles of work that they would have been producing in the past you know do trust us to be able to to create this this new environment and define those new ways of working um and i suppose as well i would really like that the the future here to um to be more to to sh that that support that our sector showed to the individual artists and the younger performers and the, the that wealth of talent we have here that 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 the wider structures uh, of support in northern ireland take that forward as well and um and and you know that that, that young freelance performers are going to be the they're the future of our industry in the same way that um uh older uh, middle-aged um and, and older uh freelance performers uh like like myself and my colleagues are are the, are the current and hopefully the future as well <laughs> but yeah that that's that that we're that we're trusted and supported to carry that through um because yeah there's there's such potential uh in this re-emergence um uh, there was something recently that i read that said you know before we um uh you know, think about getting back to normal. We have to think very carefully about what bits of normal we want to go back to. Um, and going right back to the start of this conversation about um, uh, the inequalities and problems that were there to begin with, now is an opportunity to build, build more fairer and more equitable, you know, for everyone. Really, and Kurt, what would you like to see? Well, I'm I'm going to go really blue sky. I I don't believe this is likely to happen, but since we're rethinking the world, I figure I'll I'll throw it out there. And it's actually an idea that Ali has talked about in her work before. It's being talked about quite a bit. Uh, I universal basic income would be yeah. a massive massive thing on so many levels for the arts. Uh, it's so class divided in so many ways. Uh, the arts because you know the the, the people from wealthier families have a fallback. Uh, that you know that they know that there will be a plan B, whereas there are so many people who can't even consider coming to Queens to study drama or music or any of the other arts. Uh, and, and you know you hear this story from the from the training programs that the, you know the the the, uh, the the income level skews high, skews white. Uh, you know, so the idea that we can have people not only who couldn't have considered careers in the arts before think about it as, the, you know, they already have the possibility of an income they're going to eat. Uh, you know, that's a big deal, but also the type of work that could be produced if you knew if the work fails, you will still eat, you'll still have a home. Uh, just makes an enormous, enormous difference. So I'm not expecting it to happen, but I do think that would that single thing would make a huge difference for the arts. I'll say that um, my hopes are much more pedestrian than Kurt's. As much as I hope that he is true, that I hope in a year to 18 months time, I can go out for dinner. I can go to the theater. 
<laughs> sit in a theatre with you as an audience, watching one of you performing or singing, or whether that's singing, acting, playing an instrument, and experiencing the things that I have experienced previously. But I, I hope that they change for the better. I hope we see more creativity. I hope we see more risks. I think, you know, um, uh, in my own research, I'm interested in innovation. And I know that, you know, uh, uh, that there's an awful lot of innovation is driven by need and about the need to adapt and the need to change. And we're seeing that now more than ever before. So it's a lot more, but there is a lot more pedestrian. I just want to experience the arts, not potentially in the same way that I've experienced them before, but just to have some community type experience within that, that group-like experience. Anyway, I'd like to thank you all for your really insightful and reflective and sometimes very personal experiences of how you've uh, how you've seen the performing arts within this particular space and the effect of um, COVID on what we're seeing for this particular sector. Um, it's been exceptionally interesting and I'd like to thank everybody who's listening and I'm sure that they found that very interesting too and I wish everybody the best of luck. And of course, you should come back to Queen's if we can help you at all in any, in any way, shape or form. But thank you very much much everybody thank you thank, thank you. you thank you, thank you.